Hi, everyone. Today, me and Hellevorn are going to be talking about my unpublished short story, which is called Stillness. It is about my character Tom and his family and the feelings he has about going to New York to pursue law school. Well, I really enjoyed your short story because uh, not only do we get to learn more about uh, a character who, whom we have not seen so much, uh, and that is Tom, but at the same time, we got to learn a lot more about the culture that he comes from because he's from Alaska. And uh, um, he's very different from Sam from certain respects because um, he is from, uh, from a very small town and uh, he comes to, to New York to the same university. And we have his period of adjustment and uh, we get to learn more about his family and how he compares the life he used to have in Alaska to the one that he's having now. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed the cultural elements that uh, uh, I, I saw in the story and uh, his, his views on, uh, uh, on life in New York and on the people he meets there. So um, the first thing that I would like to ask you is, uh, um, how would you compare this story to other short stories that you have written in terms of style and themes? I think in terms of themes, it's definitely one of the more, the less, least angsty ones. You know, it's not about, you know, something that's very emotional or something that, not trauma, but like something that's very negative, I would say. I think most of my stories explore something that's more controversial or negative or something that is more challenging, I guess, you know, something that, you know, kind of blocks people from achieving their goals. But here, we're not really exploring something that is like that. You know, it's just more slice of life, like you could say, less dramatic. It's just about Tom thinking about his, his life before he came to New York, and he's not particularly sad about anything, and there's no tragedy. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. that's right. That is different from a lot of the other short stories that we have and have not yet discussed. That is true, because uh, although uh, the, your short stories are generally slice of life, they are indeed more, more dramatic than this one. Um, perhaps this is also what is called stillness. It is not only about uh, the memories, but generally the, um, the mood of, of the entire story. Uh, so what about the themes? The themes, I think it's mostly about his family, mostly about his identity as someone who came from a very small town and now is in a very big town for the first time. Well, a big, very big city, I should say. Very big city for the first time. And he doesn't feel that out of place, but in a, in a way he does feel out of place because he feels like he doesn't know how to connect with people who lived such different lives. And, you know, before he came to New York City, he thought it was very easy to socialize with people. But now that he's in New York City, he feels like it's very difficult. And he wonders if it has anything to do with himself or is it just because, you know, the, the environment is too different? Mm, yes, of course, that makes sense. Uh, could you tell us more about Tom's personality? because uh, this is very interesting. Uh, it, it, this, of course, influences greatly how he feels uh, about this, this difference in environment. I think his personality is generally upbeat and confident, but he's very understated. He's not like Sam. You know, Sam is very audacious, very bold, very loud. Um, he is not like that at all. Like he prefers to be at the sidelines but I wouldn't say he's introverted. I don't think so. So like, he's kind of like an extrovert, but then he's kind of more quiet, if that makes any sense. Mm, yes, I, I see. I mean, he is, he is a, a friendly guy and he wants to be, um, to be open and on friendly terms with a lot of people and to have a lot of connections, but not to be the center of attention, we can mm -hmm. say. Exactly, yeah. I guess in a way he's kind of comparable to Frankie, but he's more extroverted than Frankie. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I also think he's more extroverted, yes. And I think this is, uh, this is one reason why he feels uh, 
uh, this change in environment maybe more strongly than if you were an introvert, right? Because were he an introvert, he would basically have the same life, he would be alone in Alaska, and he is alone in New York. But I think this is, uh, this is a, what makes the difference, right? Because he used to, to have a lot of friends, but it is, it is easier to connect with people from a small community compared to connecting with people in a city like New York. Mm -hmm. He feels like he's anonymous and that no one really wants to listen to him. And I think when he meets Sam, what he thinks is, do you have to have a personality like Sam's in order to stand out? <laughs> oh, that, how does he see Sam? Does he see Sam as a very uh, popular person or, I mean, more popular than himself? I think that Sam also doesn't fit in at law school for many various reasons, right? Because he doesn't, first of all, he doesn't actually want to be there. So that's also something that makes it hard for him to fit in because he never wanted to be there in the first place. And then secondly, you know, there's also the dimension of discrimination because most people at law school were, you know, from wealthy, well-connected communities that have been in America for many, many years. And Sam being, you know, someone who from an immigrant community just isn't seen as someone who's part of that group. So yeah, they're not racially bullying him or like punching him or anything like that. But then at the same time, he feels like he can't really connect with them on a deeper level. So in that way, he is not that popular. And I think Tom can see that, like, even though Sam tries really hard to connect with people, I think the fact that he doesn't like law school and he doesn't even really want to be a lawyer and that he doesn't fit into the, their community also just kind of drives people away. So he has superficial friendships, but nothing really good, you know, like he, he you, you can see it even if you're not part of any community there, like Tom is, he's an outsider as well. He can sense that Sam doesn't have any strong friendships at Ambrose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I see. Uh, so how does Tom perceive this difference between his life at home and his life in New York in terms of uh, uh, connections and relationships with people? Is he sad that he doesn't connect with people more? Hmm, is he sad? I don't really think he thinks it's sad per se. Like he know he knows that it depends on the environment that he's in and also in his own mood, perhaps. Maybe he doesn't feel completely at home. So that's why he doesn't have as many friends as he used to. I think he just wonders what will happen in the future. Like, will this ever change? Will he eventually get used to the environment and become more sociable again? Like, I think that's his major Ish problem, I don't know, question that he has, but I don't really think that he thinks that it's really bad. Like he's just wondering why there is a difference at this point. Mm -hmm, right, so he doesn't, he, does he feel lonely? I think he does, yes. He does feel somewhat lonely, but then his brother is also there as well. He, he's not at law school, but he's also in the city because he also came down there to pursue university. So okay. when they're both not in class, they're usually together. So it's not as bad as if he was the only person there. Oh yeah, definitely. So the fact that his brother is there makes it so much better. Mm -hmm. Is his brother as friendly and open as he is? I think generally, yes. But then he's also more belligerent. Like he's more of a slightly angrier type. Like he's not as agreeable as Tom is. So I think... Because of that, I think he doesn't express as much uncertainty in a way. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, I see. So they, they have a lot of things in common, but this is one of the differences between them in terms of how they uh, relate to other people. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because they, they could make friends together since they are together. I mean, they, they have double the chances to make friends because they are two people, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, how is he seen at Ambrose College? How do other people perceive him? Good question. I think, first of all, the dean really likes him. He thinks that he is a model student who works really hard, and he really wishes that more students would be like him. You know, he's not only a really good student, he's also athletic and involved in many clubs, which the dean really likes because he really likes to promote teamwork. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And also the Dean, when he was young, he used to be quite sporty as well, right? So, mm -hmm. so maybe he, he sort of sees himself in Tom, even though they are very, very different. But maybe this is why the Dean likes Tom. Mm -hmm, exactly. And he also likes how driven he is. And, you know, this is completely different from Sam, who doesn't even want to be there. <laughs> yeah, and it's like it's written all over his face, right? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I were someplace else. <laughs> and it's like, how can you be already a second year law student and still not know what, you know, something that was covered during first semester in first year is? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, Tom is a lot more studious than Sam is, isn't he? Mm -hmm. It's because, like, I don't think he really feels a passion for being a lawyer, but he studies a lot because he thinks that it's one of the ways he can get away from, well, he doesn't want to leave Alaska per se, but he knows that there are limited opportunities there, right? Especially now that the world is industrializing and the traditional way of life, you know, like hunting, fishing is going to die out and it's not lucrative. Right. So then he's thinking of expanding and going to a different city, like New York city, but he doesn't know how much he will enjoy it, but he wants to put a lot of effort because he thinks that with effort, you can actually go somewhere, even if you don't have the passion for it. But Sam is someone who is really like, I would say that he's very particular about what he enjoys doing. And when he doesn't like it, then he's not going to do it. Like, it's going to be absolute torture for him. Okay, exactly. So, so Tom is a lot more hardworking and the kind of person who just does what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Having a passion for it is not really a, a, an issue. Exactly. Mm, I see. I see. So... Uh, well, once he sees that in Sam, once he realizes uh, what kind of a person Sam is, what does he think? Mm. Does he wish he was more like Sam? Does he admire Sam? Does he find it weird? I don't think he thinks it's weird, nor does he really want to be like Sam. I, I think he thinks it's like a blessing and a curse. I mean, on one hand, it's great that someone like Sam really enjoys acting and you know writing and all this creative stuff but at the same time he realizes that because he's so obsessed with doing the things that he likes at the cost of giving up everything else if he's not successful then what will happen right mm, exactly exactly so so tom is very concerned with uh the outcome of what he's doing right now with 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 his life after this Right, so he, he really wants to succeed because he wants to keep staying in New York and, and making a career. Exactly, yeah. Because, you know, his father did kind of grow up in poverty. You know, he was the son of a trapper and a hunter. And basically, as those industries dried up and people started moving to small towns instead of living, you know, in very small isolated communities, you know, he realized that, you know, the next generation really has to change in order to survive. You can't really rely on the traditional way of life anymore. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, could you tell us more about Tom's family? Because I found that uh, that part of the story especially interesting. Yes. So um, Tom, he is racially mixed. He is, um, I believe, what was the actual percentage? But his father is one is three quarters Alouette and one one quarter Russian, and that makes Tom like he is half of three quarters. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alouette. So then basically he's not that connected with that heritage, but then he does feel like he's seen it because, you know, the, the town he comes from in Alaska is very indigenous. And basically his father grew up in a very indigenous lifestyle. You know, he was a trapper, a hunter, and a fisher. And, you know, basically they grew up. Um, you know, knowing how to make traditional kayaks, which is shown in the picture behind me. And Tom and his brother grew up kn knowing how to make traditional kayaks, and they actually made one for the whole family to use. That is very interesting. And the kayak is, is a symbol in the story, sort of, right? It is something that uh, is always in Tom's mind when he thinks back on his years spent at home and on his family, his father especially. 
and on the simplicity of the the life that he he used to lead there. Exactly. Yeah. And he wonders, do you need to have such a complex life to be happy? Because he looks at people around him, like the dean, you know, Sam and everyone, and they they all have a lot of complexities. And he wonders if this complexity will make them sadder than they actually need to be. Mm, that's right. That's right. So he looks at people around them and he can wonder, are they happy? I mean, they have this, this life that I traveled such a long way to have and but does this really make you happy but then he questions whether his own life was happy now mm, that's right that's right uh well he remembers his his childhood fondly but what what does he think about it was he happy back then I think he was happy, but then he realizes, like he thinks about it. Is it because I had nothing else to compare it to? What is happiness, right? I think it kind of changes. Your definition of what is happiness changes depend depends on what you are exposed to. Right, definitely. So maybe it was uh, it was good while it lasted, but do I want to do that my entire life? Exactly. Really yeah. yeah. He's not like Joel. He's not envious or anything. He just wonders if he needs to change because he always fears that he's being left behind by the times because he grew up so isolated. So he's like, what if I'm doing everything wrong? Like, What, what if I'm not working hard enough to catch up with everyone else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So um, how do you think that life in a big city affects him i mean does anything change about him um after he comes to new york so the, the fact that he's exposed to uh different cultures and different people while he grew up so isolated and different attitudes and um i don't know um does which of his attitudes change uh after being exposed to this Hmm. I would say that I think he changes in the way that he he kind of understands that, first of all, like I said, happiness is multifaceted and changes depending on your preferences and the way you change, you know, as you grow, you grow throughout life. And, the, and secondly, I think he also kind of finds out more about himself because before he was very not dependence, but because his parents were always there and he was from such a small community, he never really thought about what he himself really wanted. Like he just thought about what society wanted. And then he assumed that would fit for him because everyone does this, right? That's what we're supposed to do. And this also kind of ties in with his sexuality because I think this is kind of interesting because we just had that podcast episode about, you know, two young men from a rural society, Lars and Helgi, who were also homosexual and bisexual respectively and and Tom he's actually homosexual but then because he wasn't really exposed to it growing up he doesn't really know that but he knows that he's not 100% straight but then he kind of wonders what he actually is like he thinks am I just weird or is it really that like he just doesn't really know because there is no LGBTQ representation in that time period or where he grew up. And, you know, he also grew up a very orthodox Christian, I, which is actually kind of surprising for some people because, you know, when you think of America, you don't necessarily think of orthodox Christianity, but in Alaska, there was a very heavy orthodox influence because of the Russian colonization period. And Tom being partially Russian and Alouette as well. Alouettes were converted to Orthodox Christianity in the 19th century and 18th century. Okay, this is really interesting. I, I, I did not know this. Yeah, so that's where he got the Orthodoxy from. It's from not only the a Russian ancestry, but also the Aleutian ancestry as well, because they would all be Orthodox Christians. Okay, I see, I see. All right, so it, yeah, definitely it makes sense that he doesn't, he doesn't really, he isn't very conscious of, of how to interpret his sexuality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, when does he figure out that he's gay? He, he is gay, right? Or, or mm -hmm. he's bisexual? I think he's mostly gay. He might be a tiny bit bisexual, but he's leaning towards being gay. Oh, 
okay, I see, I see. So uh, when does he realize it and how does he feel about it? Mm, I think he realizes even back before he came to New York, but then he didn't really think that much about it. He's like, oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I feel kind of weird this year. Maybe it's something about my, my self-image or something. And then when he goes to New York, I think he sees more things that open his eyes, especially like Ardayan's bookstore. <laughs> I don't think he's ever seen anything like that before. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. But the is he exposed to anything uh, LGBT with Ardayan? I, I mean, think Ardayan has that in his bookstore because he has all kinds of materials. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and also, um, he's also, he gets to be friends with Frankie because one of the first times he talks to Sam, Sam's like, I'm actually going to my friends for, for lunch. Do you want to come? And he's like, sure. And then, you know, they go to Frankie's restaurant. That's how he meets Frankie. <laughs> And as we know, Frankie is a connoisseur of many things that are sexual. <laughs> oh, I see. So it is Frankie that's sort of initiated. Because he, <laughs> he, he's the most sexually open person, despite being raised extremely <laughs> conservative. <laughs> so, like, I guess he kind of exposes him to that once they start talking. Um, it starts becoming more obvious, but it's not about LGBTQ at first. It's just about like girls and stuff. And then he's like, wow, people actually talk like this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, he, even when they talk about, about girls, it's, it's still very different from what he was exposed to back in his little community, right? Exactly. Because I think there, there were a lot of adults and not that many children per se. Like, I mean, there were children, but then it's like when a community is really small, it just becomes very family friendly, so to speak. So a lot yeah. of people don't talk about those kind of subjects. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And in the big city, he is exposed to a lot of things, including pornography. So this is something that he certainly finds really out of the ordinary. It's something like, oh, I, I thought those things happen only in private. And, and it's something that you're not supposed to talk about. It's just something that happens naturally between man and wife. <laughs> and then <laughs> look at all these materials in Ardayan's bookstore. <laughs> and look at people just talking about them. People like Frankie. <laughs> And even Sam, like even though Sam's not as extreme, quote unquote, as Frankie, he's also much more open about it than Tom is, who doesn't prefer to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. So how does Tom feel about talking about it? I mean, he has no actual experience and, and he is also gay. So what can he possibly have to say on the subject of, uh, I don't know, women in pornography? <laughs> scared stuttering <laughs> yes exactly so uh how does frankie perceive him very good question i need to brainstorm about this more but i think frankie thinks that he's he's so sheltered like he thought joel was sheltered out of all three of them like sam, Fra sam frankie and joel right he thinks joel's really <laughs> really sheltered but then he's like oh I think now we have someone who's even more sheltered than Joel he's like how is this possible but then when he finds out he's not from New York and he's from this really small community that's really far away he's like oh yeah I think that makes more sense I mean I mean especially when you grow up here in the Lower East Side how is it possible to be like that yeah that's right and and Tom is this why died <laughs> boy i think actually frank he finds him cute because he's he's a really nice and friendly guy and i imagine that uh when when frank he sells all kinds of things he would just his eyes would be all wide well he would blush and everything i think frank he would find that's kind of cute <laughs> i think he would <laughs> and, and do you think that this would make him talk uh, things like that all the more just to see what reaction Tom has. Yeah, I think he would. And if they actually become close friends, I think Frankie might even tell him that he likes Sam. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be interesting. But then what if, but if Tom likes Sam as well, if he eventually figures out that he, he, he likes Sam, <laughs> wouldn't that be a conflict of interest? I think, I think there would be a conflict of interest, but Frankie would still say it anyways. 
Yeah, I, I don't think Frankie would realize that Tom likes like Sam. Do you think he would? Do you think he is as perceptive if, if Tom is more, is not as open about who he likes? Would Frankie be perceptive enough as to, to figure it out by himself? Hmm, I don't think so because Frankie is so focused on himself and, and Sam that he just forgets about everything else. And he also thinks that even if there is a conflict of interest, he's like, I knew Sam first. So you, you should just leave him alone. <laughs> just a newcomer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. And the attraction that Frankie has from Sam is a lot more intense with all the dreams. <laughs> well, I think Frankie is the mo most intense out of all the characters in that regard. <laughs> I, I think, okay, actually, in your view, who is more intense, Arda Yan or Frankie? <laughs> oh, definitely Frankie, because they're in a different manner. I mean, of course, Ardayan is intense, but he doesn't get very involved in his relationship with one person. I mean, he I don't imagine him forming a sort of an obsession with someone like ever, maybe when he was a teenager or something, but not even then. I think he was very cynical all his life, whereas Frankie, well, he he does have a kind of an obsession with Sam, right? Even if he's not very conscious of it first, but he's <laughs> dreaming about him, right? <laughs> that's when he realizes that there is something there. <laughs> yeah, he has all kinds of weird dreams, like even before Sam, and he actually probably hires this woman to interpret his dreams for him, which I will probably write about. It's so funny, but he's like, why do I keep on having these weird dreams? Like at first, about my teeth falling out which actually you know is usually a sign that you're very nervous about something which you know he does have that because of his family situation and then he has these weird dreams where he's like having sex with different people like even people he doesn't even really like in particular but he's like why is this happening <laughs> Wow, so so he really hires something, someone to to interpret these dreams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wonder what they would say. I mean, is that person a professional, like, like a psychologist, or is it something more based in superstition? <laughs> I think it's more based in superstition because it's like this local old lady who who does this oh so I don't think it's a psychologist but afterwards he might go to a psychiatrist or psychologist because Joel and Sam both go to one so he's like can you refer that person to me <laughs> oh yeah Frankie is the one who should have gone first because he has all these weird questions that nobody but a psychologist could answer. I mean, I don't really imagine what that kind of a, a, a woman who deals with superstitions beliefs would have to say to, to the thing, oh, I, I'm having erotic dreams with my best friend. Please tell me what that means. <laughs> what would she even say to that? <laughs> I think she will probably tell his parents or something if she knew them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. If, if, if she's from the same community and she knows his parents, that would not really be a good idea <laughs> to be so open about what he dreams. His dreams are so personal. They are very personal. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's pretty funny. Like, I think Sam, Frankie and Joel, they have a lot of funny stories together. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> or, or, oh, uh, I, I had this dream of my best friend wearing a sweater and <laughs> with, with no bags on it. <laughs> How do you interpret that? <laughs> I think they will all just give him a really weird look. Or if he doesn't specify the gender of the best friend, I think that oh, would be yeah, better, maybe. right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Maybe she would just say something like, "Oh, you have you have to get married. You have to find yourself a girl, and you will be rid of that kind of dream." So that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise she would be like oh just a moment i'm going to to check my books and she would run next door to his parents <laughs> come take your kid from there he's crazy <laughs> i think ardayan's not helping in this respect because ardayan kind of encourages this kind of thing yeah i imagine that ardayan would just encourage people for the sake of it so just to see what happens he doesn't really care about helping them or really giving answers he was like yeah you have to put it into practice everything that you dream and then he would just <laughs> ask what happened did you 
act upon that dream <laughs> so just out of curiosity I think he knows all about Frankie and his obsession with Sam and he always asks him questions about it <laughs> just to see his response oh yeah yeah I imagine our Diane doing that especially if she's he sees I think Frankie as a uh as, as a kind of a naive boy I mean as naive as, as a kid is but he's on the right track in certain ways so he has potential to, to become well more, more than naive so yeah yeah I, it, Tom it, is it, definitely scared of all of this kind of thing he did this too intense for him <laughs> oh yeah, I imagine. I imagine him going into Ardayan's bookshop and that would be really weird. He, he he would have a shop. I think I think Ardayan would find it really funny to uh, to see his reaction to mess with him. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine that he would go and and present different stuff like, "Oh, please let me show you around my shop. Here we have this and this." <laughs> so funny to see uh he he actually probably enjoys trolling okay so he likes trolling tom but the person he enjoys trolling the most is the dean oh yeah i can imagine i can imagine why <laughs> imagine if he mails him stuff oh gosh yeah that's right. <laughs> merry christmas dean and it's that <laughs> oh gosh yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He, he really hates stuck up prudes like the Dean. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And yeah, especially when he gets, I mean, he unavoidably gets to know a lot of things about the Dean that are supposed to be personal, right? So uh, <laughs> I, I think that that would make him even more uh, eager to, to send things to him with, with double meanings. You know? Double meanings, definitely. So he, he can't say anything. So after he reads it and then the Dean gets angry at him, he's like, no, that's not what I mean. You know, you're just misinterpreting it because you have a dirty mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he knows exactly what triggers the Dean. Exactly. <laughs> But that's how Ardayan is like. Like he always, he's kind of like a gaslighter. You know, he makes you think about certain things, and then he's like, "No, that's not what I wanted you to think. You're, you're just whatever. You're just too sensitive, or you're too weird, or, yeah." Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, yeah, he, he makes you believe that it was your own idea. So he, he wanted to say something different, but but it, but it's just your mind making things up. Yeah, that's really interesting that he does that. He does it to Frankie. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. I think I think his his manipulation works so well on Frankie. I mean, Frankie is 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 the one where his where Ardayan's ideas are actually very fruitful, right? And he also brings customers into Ardayan's bookshop. So <laughs> that's how Tom got there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so he's a very good disciple of Ardayan. <laughs> Yes. And I think a lot of the dreams were kind of put into his head through Ardayan's influence. Oh, yeah, that's right. I mean, he should actually pay Ardayan instead of the old woman to interpret the dreams. <laughs> yeah, he should. That would be funny. But then Ardayan would just reduce everything to, oh, this is what you actually want to do. So go put it into practice. What are you waiting for? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's your subconscious telling him what you want to do so why aren't you doing it <laughs> random question but how would Ardayan interact with Eolf oh that's interesting I mean they they would certainly talk about a lot of dirty things and <laughs> put them into practice <laughs> um, yeah I think that as long as they don't uh I don't know, contradict each other on a lot of ideas. Uh, so as long as they stick to talking about dirty things, I think they would get along really well. <laughs> oh my God. Like, do you think do you Eolf think? would look up to him or would he consider him a rival or anything? No, I, I think that he would like him. 
Mm -hmm. I think so too. Yeah. But what, what would they disagree on? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, Arian is a lot more cynical, but I don't think that's really a problem. I mean, Ingvar is cynical too, but in a very different way. And he has a very different way of, of manifesting himself. But um, I don't really think that they would really disagree on something. I mean, uh, of course, Arleon has this, this attitude where he thinks he knows the answers and Elf would not appreciate that. But I don't think there would be any topic where, where they would be put in this situation where each would say, oh, no, I'm right. I'm right. You know, mm -hmm, that's so true. I don't think it would get to that. So as long as it doesn't get to that, I think that they would get along quite well. What would Ardayana think about Eolf and his parties? I think he would really like them. Like he thinks that Eolf would you know, be a really great business partner. And he hopes that Eolf can bring more customers to his store. Oh, the business. Yeah, that would be so great. I mean, Eolf would immediately like to get into business with Hardy Jan and, and they would probably start talking about how to expand the business because Ardeyan's business is so beneficial for the world, right? I mean, exactly. I certainly believe that. Like more people should know about what you are doing. <laughs> you are helping humanity. Yeah. And he's also he also has political stuff there too. So for people who are not inclined towards that stuff, they can also read about anarchism and left wing oh, yeah. politics. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, interesting thing, and I'm. Well, this is very off topic, but I'm not really sure how much left wing Elf is. I mean, he he pretends to be upper class and very uh, well, well, definitely not. I mean, the, the opposite of mainstream, but he pretends to be upper class. So I'm not really sure how much he would support the uh, the, the movements of the working classes and true like mm -hmm. so, i mean he, he's trying to get rid of that you know to, to put that past behind him so i think this is one thing that they might disagree on i mean i think that ardayan would be judgmental of Eolf hiding his past right yeah i don't think he would like that because he's yeah, all I mean, for like class struggle and stuff like that yeah exactly and i think that this this would think that this is a way in which Eolf has fallen prey to to society right i mean he, that's else way to conform like why 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 would you why would you make these differences that upper classes are so much better than lower classes i mean why, why can't you just accept who you are i think this is one thing they would disagree on mm -hmm, exactly yeah but i i think it depends about the time period because in in of course, the more uh, information is easily, more easily accessible, he cannot hide his past so well. I mean, in, in, in our times, he would definitely not even try to hide his past because there's no point. But in the Middle Ages, it's so, so much easier to just pretend you're a very different person than you actually are. And there's really not really a way to prove it, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Since, you know, they didn't have passports or, you know, birth certificates or anything and no social media presence either. So yeah, I mean, exactly. you can just pretty much pretend to be someone else totally different. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, he does it because he can, but I'm not sure it is as important to him in, in our time. I mean, I, I don't think he would be as adamant about hiding the fact that he was poor. I think he might actually market it because it makes people yeah. listen to him. You know, oh, he has a rags to riches story. And, you know, that is like, you know what, that that's that makes a lot of books. You know, a lot of people with these kind of stories become famous. They write a book. They have a biopic produced of them. You know, one of those <laughs> inspirational movies based on a true story. Yeah, I think so. You're very right. I mean, Eolf is definitely opportunistic enough to, to let the, the times really dictate it. I mean, if, if there's something he can do to make himself more popular, then he would do it. And, and in a time where being a nobleman makes you more, more interesting and more likable, then he would pretend he's a nobleman. But in, in a time where it's, it's in, in fashion to have a rags to riches story, then yeah, he, th this is what he has. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, back to Tom. I think he would be really horrified by Ardeon at the beginning, but after a while, I think he might warm up to him and try to kind of understand what drives people to this kind of thing. Like he really wants to understand Ardeon's mentality. I think it's because Ardeon may be the character that's the most different from himself. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, very much different. Yeah, even so- more than the dean, right? Do you think? Well, yeah, I think so. I think so. Because, well, of course, Tom doesn't know very much about the Dean, he, the, the, how the Dean really is. He just knows what he sees and how the Dean presents himself. And in how the Dean presents himself, he is a, a respectable and accomplished man. So it's, it's sort of the kind of person that Tom wants to become. This is why he came in New York to become something like that. So as, as long as he doesn't know uh, the, the hidden stuff about the Dean, he would probably think that the Dean is a, is a model for That's true. anyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious about, uh, again, back to Tom's attitudes. Uh, do you think that coming into contact with, with these openness and this uh, diversity compared to what uh, he, he used to know in his hometown, uh, does he feel any pressure to, to prove something? Because I think that it is often with people from, um, from small towns and who are more isolated and more naive um, to, to sort of prove that they are different. And they would, I mean, some people would go a long way to, to try to fit in and 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 prove something you know i think he wants to prove that he's not naive and he's actually kind of insecure about the fact that some people may view him as such so i think he might be really protective of himself sometimes and not trust anyone just to make the point that you know i'm not someone who's easily fooled or you know i'm going to get scammed by someone so i think he takes to takes it to a new extreme where he doesn't trust a lot of people when it comes to money and like you know doing new stuff because he's afraid of you know something bad happening but other than that i don't think he's that defensive he's not like joel like joel tries to prove himself in every any way possible and it just comes off as really fake and annoying (laughs) <laughs> yes yes that's right yeah this, this is what i'm talking about so that does he put on any kind of mask he doesn't really he just keeps a distance so this is how it is manifested in his case but he isn't he doesn't feel some peer pressure to do crazy things for example to prove that he's not uh, a, a sheltered boy from a rural area and he and to compensate it by doing wild things, right? He, he's not the kind of person to do that. No. I think it's because he's generally, he has a higher self-esteem than someone like Joel. Like Joel, ironically, if he was in Tom's position, he might do that because he has a really bad, he has very, very low self-esteem and he always oh, yeah. wants attention. Yeah, and, and he wants to do what other people think it would be cool. <laughs> yeah. But, so. Yeah. I don't think Tom is like that because he thinks he's pretty cool already. He just thinks that, you know, I I don't know how to express that, you know, in a world where people have very different interests and experiences, but he doesn't think of himself as inferior or boring or anything like that. Mm, Yeah, 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 yeah. That that makes sense because he, uh, he, he grew up in, in a pretty relaxed environment when he, where he was, uh, very confident and of course it was his familiar environment and uh where he felt comfortable but he 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 doesn't grow up uh i don't know being put down or marginalized or everything whereas joel has a lot of issues of this kind growing up so this is what uh affects his uh self-image whereas tom doesn't have anything like this he he was taught to to believe that he was a, a capable young man who just goes away because he has more opportunities. Exactly. Does mm-hmm. he go to speakeasies and how, how does he feel about, uh, I don't know, <laughs> breaking the law concerning alcohol and stuff like that? Or does he do that? He does, I think. Yeah, I think he does. Um, Later on in the story, I think probably Frankie and Sam invite him to one. And I think he's really happy to go there because it finally feels like he's part of a group. You know, Frankie and Sam are willing to trust in him to actually invite him to a place that is technically illegal. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, but still he doesn't do anything extreme. He just goes there to socialize, you know, in a normal and friendly way. So mm. Yeah, I don't think he drinks that much either because I don't think his his father was a lightweight at like when it came to drinking, especially since, you know, I think most um indigenous people do have a problem digesting alcohol and they're like sensitive to it so I think that would probably influence how he saw it because in his community most people were either you know entirely indigenous or mixed with indigenous so they wouldn't probably drink that much because they know the effects it has mm, yeah yeah that's right that's so so he he's basically uh just a social drinker I mean he just uh, he he uses uh, drinking as a pretext to socialize, basically. So, so mm-hmm. he, he's kind of the the kind of person who just has one glass of something for the entire night, just to, to be there, mixed with water. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, he's he's mostly there to get to know more people and like see what is actually happening in the underground scene, like what do people actually do here? You know, like, do they have special hobbies that they do in speakeasies and, you know, check out the musicians and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. And also to meet different kind of people because he wants to know all the, the facets of the, of, of, of the society, of the, uh, of the city that he has uh, come to live in. So it's, it's also something like this with him. So he, he isn't coming there to be rebellious or something, just, just to meet different kinds of people. Exactly, yeah. Um, how would he compare, do you think, with someone like Helgi and Lars? Because we were saying that they are both, I mean, both, all three of them are boys from rural areas who are quite sheltered and uh, naive in a lot of ways. Uh, but at the same time, they are uh, taken out of their comfort zone in well, in different ways, but mm-hmm. still. Hmm. I would say that there is some kind of similarity in that they are kind of displaced from their original home hometown and the situation that they were familiar with. But other than that, I don't think there's that much similarity, especially since Tom never has to struggle with something as morally ambiguous as what Lars and Helgi have to go through with the raid, right? Mm, yeah, definitely, definitely. And and also there's there's this fact that uh, Helgi and Lars feel the need to, to prove a lot of things. And, and this is what pushes them to do things that don't otherwise characterize them. But exactly. They, they feel a sort of an external pressure to be in a certain way and they do their best to fit that profile but um, Tom doesn't do that. I mean, not even for, for the sake of having friends when he's in New York, he doesn't make a lot of compromises. Whereas Helgi and Laris, uh, well, they, like we were talking about in the previous session, uh, they behave in a certain way because they were taught that that was the right way to be. And uh, the fact that they are not heterosexual, uh, well, sort of amplifies that because they feel like they have even more to prove, <laughs> to, to prove that they have double the reasons to prove that they are manly. So wh- whereas Dom doesn't have to do that, he, he doesn't go through that. Mm-hmm. That's very true. Yeah, I think Tom, his life was, I guess, pretty normal, you know, unlike Joel and, you know, even Helgi and Lars, he doesn't have a lot of external pressures that make him want to have to prove something or prove a point or basically even prove a point to himself, not just society. Because I think for Joel, for as a point of contrast, he is doing it mostly for himself, not necessarily society. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Because uh, because he had those those issues going growing up, right? And he wants to prove to himself that he's not the kind of person who, uh, who, who is weak or who can be taken advantage of. Exactly. And he's much more indignant about it because his mother was always very verbally abusive towards him, which Tom didn't experience, fortunately. So even though I guess some, both of them struggle somewhat with feeling out of place, I don't think Tom thinks it's such a bad thing to be out of place, but Joel thinks it's very bad to be out of place because it reminds him of what his mother told him, which really scarred him. Oh, yeah, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
they are very different, Tom and Joel, from every point of view I can think of. Do you think t- Tom is more different from Ardayan or from Joel? Oh, no, from Ardayan, definitely. So Ardayan's the most different, and then the second one's yeah. probably Joel. Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about Helgi and Lars? Do you think they're the most different from Joel or another character of mine? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, <laughs> yeah, th- this is kind of difficult. Uh, from Joel, let's see, what would they have in common with Joel? Well, well they, they also want to prove things, but in a very different way. So I'm not sure. Whereas Ardayan, I think that they would like Ardayan very much. That's and true, they would. <laughs> they would go with Frankie to Ardayan's bookstore. <laughs> well, they would like Frankie too, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think they would love Frankie. They, they would get along so well with him. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so definitely with Ardayan, they, they would like him a lot. I mean, also because of how, uh, how much of an unconformist he is, but also because of his uh, ideas, his anarchist ideas, he would be really, I mean, Helgi and Lars would be really anarchist. <laughs> they would love that very much. And he will be, and they would be all about power to the working classes and things like that, because they, they are not, uh, they're not ashamed of being peasants and they're very much okay with that. So uh, they would love that someone is, is finally speaking up and, <laughs> and talking about that, as opposed to Eilf, right, who, who is from a lower background, but he hides it. But Ardeon just talks about it. I mean, Ardeon is, is an intellectual, in fact, right? He is, uh, yeah. He talks about the, the rights of working classes. So I think they would <laughs> like that very much about him. How about Joel? He talks about the rights of working class, too. <laughs> Yeah, but he's way too sheltered. I mean, <laughs> he's too sheltered to talk about all kinds of things because he, he, he didn't really experience any of those things. Whereas Ardayan has, has a vast life experience, so he can talk about it. Of course, maybe it's not fair to compare because the age difference is also great. I mean, that maybe Joel, when he, when he is Ardayan's age, he would have more life experience. But definitely not the same that Ardayan has. So oh. he would never be at the level of Ardayan. <laughs> no, he wouldn't, unfortunately. <laughs> how would Aiden, okay, this is so off topic, but how would Aiden interact with Joel? Because they are both very sheltered young men. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Would he um, like him? <laughs> well, I think think that they can I mean he would like to to get into debates with him because Aiden does like debates he just has a very different way to to talk about a a very different way to express himself so he's definitely not like Joel when he wants to prove a point I mean he would he would just insist on his point and and at, at one point he would just shut up if if he sees that there's no convincing the other person, he would just be like, okay, whatever. And, but, but then Joel just talks so much, right? When he wants to prove a point. Yeah, it gets annoying because even when the person, when you can feel, at least a normal person, not Joel, but other people can feel that the other person doesn't want to talk anymore, but Joel keeps on pressing the point. Oh yeah, exactly. He, he is definitely way too talkative for Aiden. But other than that, he would like to take part in debates with him and, and express their points of view. So I think they would get along quite well. But I think that Aiden would get along very well with Tom. Oh, I you're think. right. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think that they would have a lot in common and Aiden would really like Tom. And I think Tom would like Aiden as well, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's because I, I didn't, and no, Tom is one of the most psychologically balanced people <laughs> in the oh, whole yeah. story. So I didn't would enjoy that as opposed to someone like Joel, who's probably one of the more unbalanced characters. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I actually think that Tom is, is very likable. He, he's an, a person who is easy to like. 
I think so. It's because he's no, he's he doesn't overthink things. You know, Joel isn't easy to like because he always has a point to prove and he overthinks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they are in this respect on very opposite sides of the spectrum because I don't imagine, for example, any of my characters disliking Tom. I mean, really disliking him. I think that even someone like Oswald, who who is very antagonistic. <laughs> <laughs> with a lot of people, I think that he would not dislike Tom. I mean, yeah, he would find it f- funny that he's so naive and maybe he would find it uh, annoying that he's so uh, goody two shoes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but then he's not the kind of person who is very, uh, you know, holier than thou. So even if he is, he is a nice person, he's not judgmental about it. He wouldn't shove it in his face. So uh, not even asphalt would dislike Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Joel, he's not as easy to get along with. Okay, who would asphalt dislike the most? Is it Joel? <laughs> um, yes, I think it would be Joel, yeah. I think. <laughs> he would not like Sam either. Does but he Joel, think he's annoying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely, and and that he 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 puts up a facade, and and he really wouldn't like the, the kind of facade and the person underneath. So I don't think Asol would like Sam. <laughs> How about Frankie? Uh, well, I think Asphalt would like. I think Asphalt would kind of like Frankie. I mean, as long as he doesn't find out that he's bisexual, because that would really change everything for asshole i mean that would mean a great deal to him <laughs> he would sort of feel betrayed like i thought you were a nice guy <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but but frankie like the whole manliness thing it's it's only not manly when you're on the receiving end right so yeah, what yeah. if he doesn't ever do that <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's right i mean that wouldn't make it that bad. I mean, it, it depends on the way that frankly presents it. Like I, I'm just doing this to diversify my experiences. <laughs> and then maybe Asphalt would be like, okay, <laughs> okay, I can see the point. I mean, I would never do that, but maybe it's not so bad, you know? I mean, certainly someone like Hawthorne, who is also very manly, I mean, he, he, he doesn't really, uh, I mean, manly in the Norse kind of sense, he, he doesn't think much about, I mean, uh, as long, I mean, he, he can really understand that you're just doing it for fun, you know? He doesn't have a problem with that. So maybe Oswald would eventually understand it. But I think that he would find Frankie quite, quite cool. And what, he would hate the dean. I think he hates Dean the most, more oh, more than yeah. than the, than Joel and Sam. Oh yeah, definitely the dean because he's very righteous. Like he really hates righteous people. I mean, I think this is the main reason why he hates Aiden so much. I mean, oh one, true, yeah. yeah. What about Aiden? What would he think of the dean? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I. Th- think that he would I mean he wouldn't think that the dean is so bad I mean the sort of like Tom would think about the dean so as long as he doesn't know the the hidden parts of him um he wouldn't think that the dean is bad I mean he is a lot like some of the people he grew up with I mean sort of like like his brother Edgar or um even his father in certain respects so he would think that he is he's okay. I mean, he's just a, a normal kind of person for uh, medieval England, you know? <laughs> he's a guy who would fit really well in medieval England. So I think he would. He, I think he would just think that the dean is normality, you know? <laughs> he's just an average guy. He doesn't think much about him. <laughs> Would I didn't like Sam more, Joel or Frankie? Oh, Sam, Sam, yeah. More than yeah. Frankie. Uh, yeah, I think more than Frankie, yeah. I mean, the only thing that you would not like about Sam is 
it is those moments when he gets really talkative. And I think that he would find it a bit too much, but not very much because I mean, Helgi talks a lot as well. And I don't find it kind of, kind of funny most of the time. Of course, when he's a bad, he, when he's in a bad mood or, or he thinks that, yeah, I mean, he's thinking about something really serious and then there's someone at his side who just goes on and on obliviously, you know, like in the, in the story where they, uh, well, I and Helgi and Lars have to, um, have to deal with a guy, you know, that, that part. I mean, the way that someone keeps talking in a situation like that, he would be maybe judgmental. But other than that, no, he, he, he wouldn't. I mean, he doesn't have much against very talkative people, you know. So uh, other than that, he would actually like Sam. Mm -hmm. Does he like the fact that he has a facade or does he also dislike it like Oswald does? Um, he doesn't really see the point of, of Sam's facade, but he doesn't decide. I mean, I think he would say that he would be nicer without the facade, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone has a kind of a facade, right? So it's not like Sam is a lot worse. He just doesn't see the point of it, but <laughs> he was accepted. <laughs> I guess Sam without the facade is not as talkative. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So he, without the facade, he would really be much more likable for Aiden. But then for someone like, say, Ranveig, well, she would like the facade because she would find him more interesting. Otherwise, she might not even notice that he is there. You know? <laughs> so there is, there is a point, Aiden. To having yeah, a facade. Exactly. exactly. I mean, she probably would not think much of Aiden either, but Aiden really stands out because he's the only Englishman and the only Christian. So this is how he stands out. But if he wasn't, if he was just some guy from the village, she probably wouldn't think much of him compared to someone like Oswald, for example, who just <laughs> is the kind of guy who just, oh, baby, look at my muscles. <laughs> she would just look at his muscles and not notice Aiden very much. So with someone like her, yeah, Sam's facade does have a point. <laughs> but Aswell thinks his own like appearance and how he acts is the real self, right? So this is why he doesn't like facades. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and it is. I mean, he, he doesn't really uh I mean with with all the all the things that he he says that he would do it would seem like bragging but he actually does those things and a lot more i mean if anything his facade is hiding the bad things that he does even though he he talks about a lot of bad things i think that he does worse than that so. <laughs> <laughs> would ryan Vig like would ryan Vig like arda yawn <laughs> random question <laughs> um yeah i think Thing, I think she would. I mean, she would definitely find him really interesting. Like as so. interesting as Asphalt? Oh, uh, <laughs> in a very different way, but yes, I think so. I mean, she would find him intriguing and she would like to, to talk with him more and maybe she would even like to have an affair with him. <laughs> but the age difference is just way too much, right? Because he's oh, even older yeah. than Ingvar. <laughs> yeah, he is. That's true. I mean, he would, well, of course, in medieval times, it's not out of the ordinary. I mean, I, I don't think that the age is an issue, but rather the way he looks. So if, if he doesn't look old, and he doesn't act old, he wouldn't really cringe at the very idea that he is 40. I mean, she wouldn't think so much about that, as long as he finds him attractive. I mean, if, if, if he doesn't look very old, then it might not be a problem. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> but I think in the medieval ages, like 40 was a lot back then. You know, 40, a 40 year old might have looked like a 60 year old. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think that in terms of how people <laughs> looked and felt, <laughs> I think that, yeah, that it, 40 is, is quite a lot. Yes. Yeah. And 60 is like 90. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. But of course, there were a lot of people who lived to be 80 among the, the ones who had a, a good and easy life. So 
but I think that they looked older than they look nowadays. So a 40 year old man looked older. So I think those people who lived up to age 80, they spent most of their lives looking old. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so, yes. <laughs> and also they must have a lot of, a lot of problems, like medical problems, physical problems, I think, because there's, well, because of the, the way medicine was. So mm-hmm. not, maybe it wasn't so good <laughs> to live to be 80 in medieval times. And just because you haven't died yet, it doesn't mean that the quality of your life no. is yeah. so good. <laughs> so, yeah. I think a okay, lot of people. Really <laughs> That's true. Medicine, yeah. How did we get from Tom to medicine in the medieval time? I don't know. I think I was asking you with with Rhinebeck, like are they on? You know, <laughs> yeah. with, with, I didn't like Sam. Like all these random. Because <laughs> we were oh, talking is... about I didn't liking Tom. It's like would I didn't like Sam? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Um, well, one final question. Where should Tom's story go from here? Uh, so, wh- sorry, <laughs> what do you think about this? Uh, because he's a character in development still, right? And um, how do you think that the general process of, of bringing a, develop, a character in development to the level of complexity that the other characters have? Mm, I think sometimes you really have to let it go like when you force it it can be more difficult and you know maybe sometimes it makes you dislike the character more too because you feel like it's so artificial and crammed in so sometimes you just have to let go of the character and kind of just like focus on other things and then sometimes you get an idea or two and then you can go back to that character mm-hmm. okay yeah that makes sense and also not every character has to play the, the the same part in the story so as as large a part as the others so maybe some of them are just meant to uh to appear in certain scenes and to reveal certain things about the protagonist and not more than that right mm-hmm, exactly so what are your plans for tom in the future what other aspects about him and his life and his personality would you like to to explore or is it mostly his interaction with sam and the other characters and not very much about tom by himself i think it's both i think what i want to explore is tom kind of overcoming his naivety and kind of just understanding more about people in general and how to interact in more difficult situations because I think one of the things that happens is that something unexpected happens to him in New York I don't know what that is yet but that kind of changes the way he sees himself and maybe people in general and I think he and and Sam have to work it out somehow okay I see so this is where his story is going his his Mm -hmm. character arc yeah he, he would be facing um more unexpected things because of course he has already changed his views on a lot of things because he came to new york but uh well but th- this is what he had expected because he came there willingly but if something unexpected happens that would reveal more about himself mm-hmm. i don't think it's very dramatic or traumatic mm-hmm. or anything like that because i still see you know, the AU where Sam ends up with Tom, because, you know, he has a different AU depending on who he ends up with. I still see it as more of a slice of life one, especially compared to the most dramatic AU, which is the one where he ends up with Frankie. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Frankie really has uh, a tumultuous life. Exactly. And he has tumultuous feelings as well. Exactly, exactly. Yes, that's true. So Sam would be dragged into all that and he he would have a very adventurous life <laughs> with he Frank. <Frankie. laughs> Whereas with Tom, it's it's not that much. I mean, right, that they would go to to Alaska on holidays and meet the in-laws <laughs> and go kayaking. I mean, that would be really adventurous for Sam, right? It would Has be. he ever been in a boat? No. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I just remembered something funny like um I have a friend well I had a friend I'm, I'm not in contact with him anymore but the first time he was on a boat <laughs> he he was sending me a, t- a snapchat it was many years ago it was like 2015 he was like I'm on a boat <laughs> I'm on a boat <laughs> I'm like I think Sam would do that if he had snapchat and he was in the modern age 
<laughs> oh yeah, definitely, because that is so different from the experiences he's had before. So he would find it so worth mentioning to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is funny. So he he definitely has not tried any of the stuff that Tom grew up with. So like, you know, sledding, you know, with the, the dogs and stuff and, <laughs> you know, snowshoes, like he would think it's very different. Yeah, so I actually think that his, the, the AU where he ends up with Tom would, could actually be really interesting from Sam's point of view. Mm -hmm. But it will be very slice of life. Just kind of like a cutesy oh, yeah. story where they explore the wilderness and like, you know, go on hikes and stuff. Oh yeah, exactly. So nothing really dramatic. Well, yeah. They could meet wild animals. Oh, and that's really dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Giant bears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah th th this is really interesting I, I really loved comparing uh the characters with uh with one another and figuring out what uh, what they would do and how they would like each other and uh uh well I I can't wait to know more about Tom and where his story would go from here and and to see him in all these scenes at the speakeasy and with Arda Jans in his bookstore. <laughs> this will be mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah, it will be really awesome. I can't wait to explore more of this. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for, for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Hey, goodbye.